good to see everybody again. It's a lovely day. It's one of those days that I uh, was not surprised when many of you said, why don't we just meet outside, you know? It would be okay for that, right? It's beautiful out there today. Hopefully it stays that way for the remainder of the day. But it's good to see everybody today. Uh, we're continuing our look at the book of Ephesians, and today we're going to be in the second half of Ephesians chapter 2. So if you take your Bibles and turn there with me, we're going to be talking about something that the Scripture points out to us that, that helps us to understand that, that ultimately we don't need to be alienated because Scripture points out to us that we are not alone, and there's a very specific way that this portion of Scripture illustrates that for us. So I'm going to read the whole section for us, and then we're going to look at it a section at a time as we, as we go on. But Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 11, this is what it states. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to start off our week gathering together, singing songs of praise to you, praying to you, worshiping you, enjoying fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and sitting under the teaching of your word. Lord, we know that throughout the course of each day that we live and throughout the course of each week that we live, that we are bombarded with all kinds of influences and all kinds of pieces of information and things like that come flying at us quite regularly and quite aggressively. And Lord, we're just so grateful that, that as believers in your son, Jesus Christ, we are convinced that you have called us to gather together to worship you. And we do so, Lord, as we start our week. So, Lord, thank you for allowing us to carve out this time, and we pray, Lord, that you'd prepare our minds and prepare our hearts in the brief time that we have together to understand the deep theological truths that you're talking about here in this portion of Scripture through the Apostle Paul. So we pray that you'd speak to us now. We commit this time to you, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So... Prior to becoming a pastor, I had uh, a lot of daydreams about what I thought my life would look like when I was actively pastoring a church. And, you know, I, I, I often say this to my wife, I think I dream more when I'm awake than I do when I'm sleeping. I, I'm, a, I'm a daydreamer, all right? So sometimes she even catches me kind of just drifting off in, into the distance. And I used to daydream about what I thought life and pastoral ministry was going to be like. And... Um, and, and I wondered things like, all right, where would I serve? What will the context be like? What, what's it going to look like when I'm actually serving in it? I also wondered if I would serve as a pastor in the traditional sense or if I might get involved in church planting because I had a strong tug to get involved in church planting. So I wondered how that would work out. And by the grace of God, I've been allowed to, to do both. And I'm really grateful for the things that the Lord's allowed me to see and witness in the process. So some of you know that several years ago, a church about 30 minutes from here shut down, and basically turned itself over to us. Uh, the building, the property, the ministry, everything there was just turned over to us. We were trying to figure out what to do with it, and we prayed about it and decided that the Lord was calling us to plant a new church in that location. 
So the building needed lots of repairs, and so a whole bunch of us from the church here and some others would go and make trips there, and we would repair the building, and we would do all sorts of things that needed to be done there, and the building looks really sharp now. It looks really, really good. Um, we also needed to find long-term leadership to serve there once it got going, and to be honest with you, that's a process that's still underway. We have a, a new individual that just was approved to serve there, so you could pray for him. At some point, I, I'm looking forward to introducing him to you here uh, because I've invited him to come and introduce himself to us here. But that's a long process, and I'll tell you what, that's a community. It, by the way, it's, the only, it's in West Conchahawk, and it's the only church in town. Literally every other church in that town over the course of the past decade shut down. It's the only church in that community. So we feel like we have a very strong uh, calling to be a church for West Conchahawken. So that process is still underway, but I'm grateful for the things that the Lord's already shown us and allowed us to see in the midst of that process. And one of the coolest things that's occurred over the past few years is we've been trying our best to get that church to really take hold in that community has been in the life of a woman named Beth. And Beth was one of the first people that got involved in that church once we got it going. She's lived in West Conchahawken for decades. I, I forget exactly when she moved there, but I think it was in the early 80s, if I remember right. And just before we opened that church for its first worship service, her husband passed away at a relatively young age, younger than you expect people to pass away, to be honest with you. Now, Beth's background is Jewish. She's grown up Jewish. That, that was, that's her, her family background. That's her religious heritage. Jewish in every sense of the word. But she could sense that in the midst of her grief that she really needed the presence of God in her day-to-day -day life. And so when she heard that this church was opening up in the town, she decided to come and visit. And she decided to come and check it out and see what it was like. And soon after she came and visited, Beth came to faith in Jesus Christ. She's come to trust in him as her Messiah. She's come to trust in him as her Lord. Her faith is still new. She would admit there's a lot of things that she's still trying to grow in, things she's attempting to learn. Uh, by God's grace, this is also really cool. Her neighbor um, recently, her new neighbor said, uh, hey, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Tell me about yourself. And so I met with her neighbor and I said, listen, could you help disciple Beth? You guys live next door to each other, so now they meet a couple times a week for Bible studies. They're currently going through the Gospel of John together. It's very exciting. And recently, Beth asked me a question. I preached there a few weeks ago on a Sunday night, and uh, she asked me a question, and she said, we did a question and answer time, and uh, she said, can you do me a favor, and could you clarify some of the things that the Bible teaches about God's plan for the Jewish people? Could you just like show me the things that the Bible says about God's plan for the Jewish people? And it was a fascinating discussion. And that was, um, you know, as we were preparing to start going through the book of Ephesians here. And so I encouraged her. I said, you know, one of, the, one of the books of the New Testament that really talks a lot about this is the book of Ephesians. I'm preaching on this at Core Creek. Maybe you ought to check it out. And I kind of walked her through some of the, the things in Ephesians, including things that we're talking about today. And uh, because the scripture tells us that, that God takes Jews who believe in Jesus and Gentiles who believe in, in, in Jesus and unites us into one new body, the church. And so I was explaining these things to her from a theological context, but also a practical context. And it, you, you got to admit to, you know, to Beth in, in particular, she said that's very meaningful. This is very meaningful, very encouraging to her. And the portion of scripture that we're looking at today emphasizes that union. You know, that union of Jew and Gentile into one new body called the church through Jesus Christ. And it also demonstrates that God has not called us to live our lives spiritually alone or spiritually alienated from him and his promises. It's a very encouraging portion of scripture. So I want to just take it a piece at a time today and work our way through it. And I hope that you find encouragement from it as well as I do and as Beth does. I hope it encourages you. And one of the things that this scripture starts out with is a reminder to us that Jesus invites us to be near to him. Let me reread verses 11 through 13, because there it says this. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision. Now, we're going to come back to that phrase in a second. By what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by the hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and stranger to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off 
have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, let me pause there for just a second. Have you ever felt insulted or put down? It's funny, when you say those things, people are like immediately people that do that to you come to mind, right? People that insult, people that put down. I've got a few people in my life that tend to have a habit of that. You probably have some people in your life that have a habit of that as well. But how does that impact the nature of your relationships with, with people that insult you or with people that maybe put you down or try and demean you? I have to confess to you, and I'll be real anonymous with this. Um, recently, it, it started to become very obvious to me that I have a, a, a good friend that has a bad habit of doing that. And it didn't dawn on me at first. Uh, I still consider him a friend, but his, his humor mainly consists of put-downs. And he usually focuses on, I noticed the pattern, he usually focuses on things related to physical attributes or someone's appearance. So things that people can't really even do a whole lot about. And, um, and I know enough psychology to know that when people do that, that's usually an indicator that they are feeling insecure about the very things that they are trying to pick on other people for. But I have to admit, I, I, I don't appreciate his style of humor, and I've noticed that he's doing a really good job of alienating a variety of people from being willing to be in close friendship with him because it's always a put-down, another put-down, another insult. And you look at that and you're like, all right, that's not wise. Now, I bring that up because when you look at how this portion of Scripture opens up, in this portion of Scripture, Paul, he begins it by reminding his readers of an insult. He begins by reminding us of, of a put-down that the initial readers probably were pretty familiar with. In that era, it was an insult for a Gentile to be re referred to as the uncircumcised or the uncircumcision by Jewish people. Now, physically speaking, that very well may have been accurate. But it was meant more as an insult than anything else. It wasn't a, describer, a, a, you know, a description of a medical condition or a medical state. It was, it was basically to say, you are insulted. You know, you are, you, it was basically a way to say, uh, you are obviously outside of the covenantal blessings of God. You are not part of our fellowship. You are excluded. It was meant to be an insult. And I'll give you a great example from 1 Samuel chapter 17 that shows when this insult was used in another context as well. You, I think everybody, regardless of your church background, you're probably familiar with the story of David and Goliath. Are you familiar with David using this insult in that particular context? As he's trying to figure out what's going on, why are so many of the, the men of Israel, why are they so fearful, why are they afraid? And then people tell him, look, we've got this Philistine, we've got this giant, Goliath, who mocks us and he threatens us every day. And David got some courage to him. And he basically was saying, who is this guy? And this is how he said, you know, like in our context, we would look at somebody and be like, who is this loser, right? I'm not going to let some loser, some loser Philistine tell me or tell my people that this or that is going to be the case. They're not going to let this loser insult us. But in his generation, they didn't say that. They said it this way. Look at what he said in 1 Samuel 17, 26. It says, And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So, so do this now, all right? Next time someone in your life insults you, just be like, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that would insult me? You insult, you uncircumcised Philistine? Be gone, right? Hey, it worked for David, right? <laughs> Filled him with courage, and you know the rest of that story. But you have the Apostle Paul looking at this, and he's saying, he's like, listen, you know the insult, right? You know what they called you. You, you know what you were, you were, it was basically to say, you're not in. You're outside the fellowship. You're not a recipient of the blessings. And keep in mind, Paul's background is he's saying these things. Paul's a man who grew up Jewish. And he makes a point elsewhere in Scripture to tell us, like, he wasn't just Jewish. He was highly involved in his faith and had the credentials to, de to demonstrate it. And he used that as an example here as he's talking about this idea of these people being called the uncircumcision to, to basically show these people that, yeah, all right, you're not by birth, uh, a, you know, you're, you're not Jewish by birth, right? 
And um, still, Jesus has done something very special for you. You were ostracized, and he looked at your condition, and he did something about it. Now, it's true that the Gentiles were once separated from Christ, right? The things that Paul lists here. They were once separated from Christ. They were alienated from God. He talks about the fact that they were unfamiliar with the promises of God, that they were without hope in this world. That's a pretty sad thing, right? Do you imagine living your life without hope in this world? Well, Paul is describing a life apart from Christ. He says, listen, you were without hope in this world, but what do we know? Jesus came to this earth to fix all of it. And when Christ gave his life and when he shed his blood on the cross, what Paul's trying to demonstrate here and explain is the fact that when Jesus did that, he atoned for the sins of all who trust in him, regardless of their ethnic background. His blood cleanses Jews who trust in him. His blood cleanses Gentiles who trust in him. And he gives all who trust in him a new identity in him as he draws them unto himself. So we who were once distant from him are invited to come near to him. Jesus invites us to be near to him. So do this, right? There's two ways you can look at a portion of Scripture like this. You could look at this and say, all right, that's a theologically heavy portion of Scripture. And just kind of think about it in, a, in an academic sense. But I don't think that that's the only way to look at this. I think we're supposed to look at this and examine our hearts. And I think there's two things that we could really wrestle with as we look at that. First of all, are you convinced that Jesus is near to you? And secondly, are you convinced that he welcomes you into his presence? Because that's what the Apostle Paul's trying to explain here. He's saying, at one point you used to live your life like he did not want to be near to you, and you certainly didn't want to be near to him, and you certainly weren't convinced that he welcomed you into his presence. And what Paul is saying is that Christ has come to this earth to fix all of that. And that he does that for you, and he does that for me, that he does that for everybody who will trust in him. Well, Paul goes on to explain a little bit further the benefits of what Jesus has done on our behalf. And he explains here that Jesus is offering us peace through him. Let me read verses 14 through 18. There it says this, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So keep that phrase in your mind, the dividing wall of hostility. And he says, By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father." Now, uh, I, I don't know where you were, what season of life you were at when the Berlin Wall came down, but when I was in high school, I distinctly remember the Berlin Wall in Germany being torn down. Remember how excited, uh, you know, just so many of us were to see East and West Germany united together again. And even though those events were taking place in a culture that is a, a different culture from our own and a different part of the world from our own. Many patriotic Americans looked at that union and celebrated it for a variety of reasons because it offered visible evidence that communism was collapsing in the region as well. So we liked that also. Now, during the era of the Cold War, so the time from World War II up to, you know, right around that, that period of time, during the era of the Cold War, those of us that were alive during that time remember the hostility that existed between the United States and between the Soviet Union. It's a lot of hostility. I remember as a kid thinking about it quite regularly that they might bomb us with a nuclear bomb and that we might bomb them with a nuclear bomb. And, um, and, I, and I used to think, well, I guess if that happens, I probably won't know. You know, I mean, like, I mean, I'll find out in heaven, hey, how'd I get here? Oh, uh, yeah, it was a nuclear bomb. I knew that was going to happen, right? Um, and, but I remember, I used to think about that a lot. And uh, I remember the news would talk about, you know, two missiles have destroyed each other over the Atlantic and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, my goodness, like, what are we practicing for? And then I remember somewhere along the way, um, looking at what Scripture said about the end times and thinking to myself, it's like, oh, wait, that's not how it ends? Oh, it ends differently than that. Oh, kind of helps to read the end of the Bible. All right. 
So the Russians don't blow up the world. Good to know. Okay. Um, but I remember after the Soviet Union collapsed, a lot of the hostility that many of us had felt during the, those years, you know, during the Cold War, a lot of that started to fade, at least to a degree, maybe not perfectly, but to a degree as Russian, you know, Russia became a country again, and, and then democracy started spreading over there, again, to a degree. And, um, and so, you know, some of that hostility lessened. But if you want to see an example of hostility that has existed for many centuries, like a wall dividing a city, all you have to do is just look at the historical instances that, uh, where, where you have Gentile nations and the Jewish people in conflict. It's not a pretty picture. Some of the darkest elements of human history have happened in the midst of that conflict. And when you look at how that's played out, it's almost unbelievable to think about some of the things that people have done that they justified their activity based on that conflict. Some of the darkest moments in human history have happened in the midst of that. And so you look at that, and that's a long-standing hostility. It's a hostility that existed during the Old Testament era between the, the Gentile nations and the Jewish people. It's a hostility that's existed right up to the present era. And it's not good. And so you look at what the Apostle Paul says here in the portion of Scripture that we just read, and it reveals to us that Jesus came to tear down that wall of hostility. And not only did he come to tear down that wall of hostility, but in like fashion, he offers us peace through him. He is the way peace is found. We're not going to find peace through governmental leaders, although I appreciate when they try. But Jesus is ultimately the one that peace is going to come through. Scripture tells us that Jesus came to fulfill the righteous requirements of the Old Testament law and then to make peace between Jews and Gentiles by uniting them into one body, the church. So if you're Jewish and your background is Jewish and if you're Gentile and your background is Gentile, what the Scripture is ultimately telling us is that you have a new identity. You are, your identity is in Christ what it once was is not as relevant as the fact that now you are in Christ through faith in him. And so think about it this way. You know, just picture in your mind the crucifixion. You know, as Jesus is being crucified. And when you're crucified, your arms are stretched out. You've got your arms stretched out. In his case, you have these nails piercing his wrists. A lot of times we reference a hand. In that culture, they'd refer to the hand as being basically up to here. So even when you would talk about an area like this, you're talking about the hand, as they would say it. And they would typically put the, the nail here because you have a lot of small bones there that can hold it better in place than if you put it here because there you just have some thin skin that's probably just going to rip if you try and hang somebody from it. So they pierce Jesus in both of his wrists, both of his hands. And he's got his arms extended in both directions. And when I picture that in my mind, and when I think about what Jesus did as he accomplished his atoning death on the cross, you can say that in one sense, one of his hands was reaching into the past toward the Jewish people, the people that the covenants were given to, the people that the prophets were sent to. So you have that one arm reaching into the past to the Jews, and you got that other arm reaching into the future to the Gentiles who are also now being invited to become part of the family of God. You've got both arms reached out in both directions. And what Jesus was seeking to do in his sacrificial death was to reconcile us. And that's what it took to actually accomplish it. Now, to reconcile means to take something that's far away and bring it near. Take something that's far away and bring it near. Um, the, I hope they don't mind me saying this because, you know, they're in visiting from Ohio, but we had a, a fun visit the other night with uh, Nick and Lauren Coates. So, Nick and Lauren, you made it to the message today. I hope that's all right. If it's not, I'll scrub it from the recording. No sweat, all right? But we had a chance to see them the other night and see their kids. They lived in the area here just a few years ago and, and moved out there, and now they're back visiting, saying hi to everybody. So if you can get a chance to say hi to them yet, make sure you say hi. We got a chance to meet their children. And, uh, well, we've met their children in the past, but their children probably didn't remember us because it was a few years. 
But you know, one of the cutest things that I notice with children, when a child walks up to you, and I saw it the other night, was reminded of it, of it again, when a child walks up to you as they get to know you, when a child trusts you, what do they typically do, especially a young child, when they're conveying trust, what do they do? What do they do with their arms? It's like the universal symbol that a child knows. They just walk up to you and their arms go out, right? Now, as an adult, you know, as we had the, the Coates family over and their beautiful children were there in our home, and as their child, you know, as Liam looks up and he goes like this. Obviously, I looked at Liam, I was like, nope. <laughs> right? Nope, sorry, you ate too much dessert, Liam. No, what do you do? Right? A child reaches out their arms to you. If you have any conscience whatsoever, where do your arms go? Right? Come, let's do this. You pick them up, right? And you look at Christ. What is Christ trying to do? He's saying, you were far away. You were far away. Come near. Those of you in this direction, and those of you in this direction, I will reconcile you both through my death in this moment. I will take you who were far away, and I'm inviting you, and I'm saying, come near. And he stretched out his arms, and he invited us. He extended that invitation. Through Jesus, we who were distant from God are invited to become part of his family. And he offers that same kind of reconciliation to Jews and Gentiles at the same time. And you know what's kind of interesting? You think about it. If we're all accepting that invitation, what are we doing? He's not just bringing us near to him. He's also bringing us near to each other. As we're reconciled to him, he's also reconciling us to one another. So in his work on the cross, what was Christ doing? He was doing the very thing that the Apostle Paul said here. He's tearing down that dividing wall of hostility. Now, I know that there are people that love to continue to try and add more to that wall and build on that wall and encourage people to stay divided in all kinds of contexts. In fact, so many public voices right now irritate me to the core. I'm saying that the nice way, right? They irritate me to the core because this is what I hear from their lips. Hey, people, divide. Hate each other. Fight each other. And if you weren't mad, let me tell you something bad about this group so you hate them. And if you weren't mad, let me tell you something about this group so you hate them. Divide, fight, fight, fight. That's all I hear. And then you look at the cross. And you have Jesus saying, I came to tear down that dividing wall of hostility and offer peace and reconciliation. You were far away, and I'm saying, come near to me. And as we collectively come near to him, we're going to be coming near to one another and he offers us that reconciliation with one another as well. And let me even say this. As Jesus invites us to experience that kind of spiritual reconciliation through faith in him, don't forget that that's also meant to be lived out in our day-to-day -day lives as well. You know, you and I are to live our lives with the understanding that we are welcomed into his presence, but we're also to live our lives with the understanding that just as Christ took those of us who were far away and brought us near, again, that's what reconciliation literally means, to take something that's far away and bring it near, doesn't that make you think a little bit about somebody in your life that maybe it's time to reconcile with? Is there hostility that's lasted for a long time that maybe it's just time to end? As we've been reconciled to Jesus, as we who were far away have been brought near, as that dividing wall of hostility has been torn down in the spiritual realm, is that not supposed to have a day-to-day -day practical application in our relationship contexts as well? Who's far away that should be brought near? You want to spend the rest of your life unreconciled? Now, you can't make someone reconcile with you if they don't want to, but you know what you can do? You could open up your arms to it and see what happens. That's what Christ did for us. He doesn't make any one of us reconcile to him. You know, I don't know the hearts of those of us gathered here. I don't know the hearts of those that will, live, uh, that will listen to this recording. I don't know those hearts, but Christ knows. And the invitation's open, it's just whether or not we accept it. Many people choose to go their own direction, and that's how they live, in conflict. Conflict with their creator, conflict with those that have been created. But Christ offers reconciliation through him, and then he invites us to live it out. There's one other thing that the Apostle Paul brings out in this portion of Scripture that I hope that we'll see today, and that's this. 
The Holy Spirit is building up those who are united to Jesus. Let me read to us from verse 19 down to verse 22. There it says this, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Isn't that beautiful, just how it's stated right there? You're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Isn't that a beautiful portion of Scripture? Um, by the way, uh, what do you suppose your pastor and his family do on Saturday nights? Do you have a guess? Can I just tell you? Uh, last night we went to uh, uh, a heavy metal concert in uh, New Jersey. Is that all right? Like, I, I, I was, as we were there, it was like midnight last night. Um, I, I said to my wife, I said, I have to preach in like 10 hours. And I was like, but here I am, like I can't hear anything and uh, I'm having a really good time at this concert. Now, a few months ago, I had the opportunity to have a conversation with John Cooper. I don't know if you know who John Cooper is. He's the lead singer of a band called Skillet. They're a Christian band. And, um, and so it's kind of interesting when you get to talk to somebody that you've known about and listen to their music for a long time because they always say, don't meet your heroes, right? Because you're going to meet them and you're going to discover that they're not what you thought they were going to be. Well, this was the opposite. He and I were talking about our faith, and uh, we talked for about an hour uh, just a few months ago, and we really hit it off. And he said to me, he said, I said, oh, it's cool. You guys are going to be not too far from us. You're going to be in New Jersey in September. And uh, he revisited that later in the conversation. He said, hey, are you, are you actually going to come to the show? Because I told him our family had already seen them in concert a few times. He said, are you planning to come to that show? And I said, I, yeah. I, I said, I, I, I think we'll be at that show. And uh, he said, well, do me a favor. He said, uh, just talk to, and he told me who to talk to. He, he said, just talk to them because... I think it'd be nice for us to get together beforehand and maybe, maybe we could like, you know, just say hi and talk for a little bit before the show. And uh, in my mind, I'm like, uh, yeah, so I'm definitely going to do that. And I was joking with people before church today. I, was, I, I said, all right, I'm also definitely not going to hold you to that, right? That's not one of those things. I, in my mind, I was like, I'm not going to hold you. That's, this was several months ago. I thought there's no way he's going to remember that, that that was a conversation that we had. We had only met the one time. And uh, so we got there yesterday. We got there early. We, I received an email saying, get there early. So we got there early. It was like 4 o'clock when we got there. And we went and we stood in one particular place. And eventually someone came out. And there was a group of people that started standing behind us. And someone came out and, and uh, they said, all right, we're going to start taking, uh, uh, before we start letting people in for general admission or anyone that's doing the meet and greet, we're going to take in uh, any VIPs first. And uh, so I was like, I wonder who the VIPs are. And, uh, and so we're standing there, and, and, uh, and the lady said, any VIPs? And I'm, I'm looking, and I said, did they give you names? And, uh, and she said, yeah. And I, I said, the name John Stonge on that list? And she said, oh, yeah, John Stonge. Yeah, come on in. And I was like, sweet, this is awesome. And I was like, <clears throat> yeah, we're good. And so we, we, we came in, and I, I looked at my family, and like, knowing that we'll have a conversation about it later, but it was kind of one of those looks like VIPs. <laughs> so we walked in and uh, got to hang out with the band for a little bit, talk with them, take pictures with them, have conversation with them. John gave me a copy of his book, so I gave him a copy of my book. I was like, hey, you know, if you want to promote that online, like a little bit, I didn't ask him to do that. <laughs> Hope he listens to this recording and does that, though. Uh, but anyway, the point being... We were strangers, and now, at least in the most basic sense, I consider him a friend. We've had a chance to have a couple nice conversations, someone you know about that then becomes a friend. And I have to tell you, it feels good when someone looks at you and your wife and your children and says, oh yeah, we want you in. That felt special for all of us. We all admit, we're like, they made us feel special. Now, we didn't do anything to deserve that. We didn't do anything to earn that. That's on them. They chose to be generous. They chose to be kind to a family that they could have easily just said, no dice. 
And I love stuff like that because on a deeper level, when you look at a portion of Scripture like this, isn't it a relief to know that when the Lord looks at you and when the Lord looks at me, that through Christ Jesus, we are considered the friends of God. That's what Scripture's teaching us, right? Isn't it a relief to know that, like the Scripture says, that we, were, that we were once considered strangers, we were once considered aliens to the kingdom of God, but then through Jesus, we have been given citizenship in God's kingdom. We made, we've been made members of his own household. We've been made VIPs that are allowed to walk in and spend time in his presence. And as men and women who are united to Christ, as men and women who are part of the household of God, part of the family of God, this scripture tells us we're also being invested in. So the Holy Spirit is actively building us up. He's actively building you and me. The ministry that he accomplished through the lives and through the teaching of the apostles and the prophets, it's having an impact on our present day growth. And then all believers, regardless of heritage, are being built into a holy temple where the presence of God is dwelling, and this scripture tells us that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of this temple. That Jesus is the cornerstone of this temple. Now, anyone here into architecture? Is anyone into building architecture? Anyone a contractor? Kind of knows stuff about buildings? Some of you are, you just don't want to raise your hand. All right, that's fine. I know what you do. All right, all right, finally, there we go. Now we got some hands, all right, there we go. When you look at many buildings, you see a cornerstone. Typically on the cornerstone, what do you see? A date, right? You see a date, right? You know what the actual purpose of a cornerstone is? Does anyone know? All right, some of you know? Yeah, according to a, um, is the actual technical definition of the purpose of a cornerstone. In relation to architecture, a cornerstone is traditionally the first stone that is laid for a structure, with all other stones laid in reference to that cornerstone. That cornerstone's put there first, and it kind of sets the pace. It kind of sets the pattern. The definition also says a cornerstone, it marks the geographical location by orienting a building in a specific direction. So that building's going to be oriented in a very specific direction based on where that cornerstone is placed, based on where that cornerstone is pointed, based on the very nature of that cornerstone. And so how perfectly fitting is it that Paul refers to Jesus Christ as the cornerstone of our faith? The whole thing points in his direction. And as the church is built one life at a time, one living stone at a time, we're being pointed toward Jesus. And all aspects of our lives are to be lived in reference to him and in reverence of him. Now here's the thing, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of patience, it takes a lot of work to build a building, and I would say it takes even more to build a life. And so many people go through their life in this world like a wrecking ball, or so many people go through their life in this world like an arsonist that's just there to tear things down and tear people down. And there are people in your life that, that kind of operate like those arsonists or like those wrecking balls, right? And maybe you've been on the receiving end of that kind of activity, but we can be grateful that the Spirit of God is actively building us up in Christ. So as we finish up this morning, let's just think back to the, to the things that we just had the time to kind of start our week off by thinking about, because they're all significant. It's all found here in Ephesians 2, starting with verse 11. Jesus invites us to be near to him. Jesus is offering us peace through him. And the Holy Spirit is actively building up those who are united to him. It's good to be part of the family of God, is it not? There's nothing better. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege to be part of your family through faith in your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we're grateful for the fact that, that you treat us in a way that it's just so far beyond what we deserve. We don't deserve the good treatment we receive from you. We didn't treat you that way. You came to this earth and we treated you like refuse. You came to this earth and we insulted you. We cut you down. But Lord, you look at us and you show us compassion and you show us mercy. And Father, you offered the Son...
knowing that it was only through your son that the dividing wall of hostility could be torn down. And Lord, we see as we look around us, it doesn't, we don't even have to look far, we just look five feet in front of our face. We see conflict, we see hostility, we see division, and we see the people that stoke it day by day. By your grace, Lord, we pray that those that, that feed and fan those flames, we pray that you would open their eyes to the truth of your gospel, that they would see the nature of what you do in the spiritual realm, to bring peace, to end hostility, to unite, to reconcile, and that they would experience that change of heart, that they would experience that kind of reconciliation. Because, Lord, we know that without your intervention, we're stuck. We are alienated, and just like this scripture reminded us, we would be without hope. Without your intervention, we are absolutely without hope. So, Lord, I'm just so grateful for the fact that we could look at a portion of scripture like this and not just think about it in a theoretical or distant kind of way. We could look at this and we could say, wait a second, that's what you did for me. You did that for me. You did that for my wife. You did that for my kids. Lord, it's just so wonderful to think that you would love us like that. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to live as men and women who are supremely grateful for your goodness because you demonstrate it to us in powerful ways. And Lord, I'm so grateful that in the midst of this era that we live in and the season of history that we live in, that I don't have to put my hope in today. And I don't have to put my hope in faulty people because I've got my hope in you. I love that, Lord, and I love that about you. So, Lord, today we pray would be a day that we would rejoice in the fact that, Father, your Son, Jesus Christ, is our cornerstone. Through the power of your spirit, we pray that you would just continue to point our lives in the direction of your son. We love you, Lord. We're grateful for this portion of your word. And we're just grateful for your goodness to us. Thank you for this new day. Thank you for this new week. We commit it all to you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.